There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to, the, to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. actually need to live in? If you 
have more clothes in your closet or more food in your refrigerator and pantry than you can actually use. If you have more stuff than you personally need to survive, you're rich. And if you're a Christian, you know that ultimately all of this has come from God, who gives good gifts. All comes from God's hand. We talked about that last week. It's God who has blessed us with more than we need. So we have to ask ourselves, I have to ask myself, do I deserve it more than others? Do I work harder? Am I smarter? Does God just like me better than 96% of the world? No, absolutely not. The reason is that he's given me more than I can actually use is because he wants me to use it for his purposes. But how? That's the real question. How am I supposed to use it? How am I supposed to be good at being rich now that I know I'm rich? How am I supposed to be good at it? Well, the man in Jesus' parable today is not good at being rich. So we're going to learn by a negative example. Let's take a closer look at these two men, Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus, abject poverty. He's covered with sores. The dogs come to lick his wounds. Imagine a very pitiful sight. <coughs> Complete rags. The man on the inside of the house wore the finest clothes. Beautiful clothes. Ate sumptuous meals every day. Now, what a contrast. It's like I said, two complete extremes. Extreme wealth that could have formed the, the best in the world. Food, clothing, and shelter. And extreme poverty that lacked all three of these. And all within sight of each other. All within sight of each other. That's something we don't have to deal with usually because where we live, we don't have beggars laid at our doorstep, do we? We see them down the road perhaps, but not at our doorstep. Well, since Lazarus was literally laid at the man's doorstep, that meant he saw, meant he saw him every day. In fact, he'd have to step past him every time he left his house. He had to see this pitiful sight. He had to hear him, probably begging or maybe even moaning, probably smell him. But he never responded to the man's needs. As for Lazarus, I can only imagine how difficult it must have been to live within sight of such opulent wealth and not to have anything, not even the basics. Well, the next picture Jesus gives us in the parable this morning is the two men's death. Lazarus died, and the angels come to carry him to Abraham's side in heaven. And the rich man died and was buried. So we get this beautiful, heavenly description, and then the rich man died in spirit. Another stark contrast. And also, apparently, within sight of each other again, because we see that Lazarus is reclining, enjoying glories and, and splendors we can't even begin to imagine, that we don't even have a vocabulary for. And this formerly rich man is languishing in hell, in agony, in torment. No sumptuous meals. No fine clothes. All the wealth that he enjoyed while he was on the earth is gone now. It's not serving him any good whatsoever. Yet, even the reality of judgment didn't succeed in changing this man's perspective, his selfish ways. Because what does he ask Abraham? Send Lazarus to dip his finger in cool water and touch it to my tongue because I'm in agony here. This really gets my blood boiling. <laughs> Every day, he was with arm's reach of this man in need, and he had the means and the resources to alleviate his suffering, and he chose not to. And now he wants that same man to come into the fires of hell to alleviate his suffering. Well, I think he got a very gentle answer from Abraham. He sure wouldn't have gotten this answer from me. Because <laughs> Abraham calls him son and explains to him why this is impossible. He calls him son. I think that, I hope that shocks you as much as it shocks me, but it's a reminder of the compassion that God has, even for sinners. His, his compassionate heart. He's told his, his request is impossible because there's no passageway between the two. They're separate for all eternity. Finally, finally, too late, but finally, this rich man, formerly rich man, 
shows his first act of compassion. He wants someone to go, he wants Lazarus to go to the home of his father and tell his brothers so they won't have to suffer the same fate as he did. And Abraham says they got all the scriptures to explain to them how this works. And if they don't believe the scriptures, they're not going to believe someone who's raised from the dead. And of course, that's a painful reminder as well, too, because we now have someone who's been raised from the dead, Jesus Christ. And for some, that's still not enough. There's ample testimony of God's love. There's opportunities to hear about salvation. And yet, some still cannot believe. Reminds me of what Paul said in his letter to the Romans in the first chapter. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. And then a few verses down, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things, rather than the Creator who was forever praised. Paul's talking about the wrath of God being revealed against godlessness and wickedness of mankind. Godlessness means a lack of reverence, a lack of belief in who God is. It's, it's the rebellion that's at the heart of all sin. And wickedness means injustice regarding to how people treat one another. So putting these two together, you get the sum of the law, as Jesus said. How do you, how do you summarize all of God's law? loving God, and loving others as we ourselves have been loved. Now, it's hard to talk about God's wrath because it's frightening. It frightens me too. But it's important that we talk about it because Scripture talks about it very clearly and very often. And the rich man, given the benefit of his new perspective, saw how important it was for people still living to know about God's wrath and the reality of judgment and punishment. But what we have to remember when we talk about this is that God's wrath is a manifestation of His love. It's because He loves us so deeply that anything that threatens to harm or destroy that which He loves, us, is what His wrath is turned against. It provokes His anger, His wrath. It's the anger at sin that separates us from Him. Think of the wrath of the parent of a drug-addicted child. That anger that burns to think that those substances are going into your child's body and poisoning them, them, robbing them of the life that they should have, and ultimately may kill them. To have tolerance or even, God forbid, acceptance of such behavior would not be considered loving at all, would it? The wrath exists precisely because the love is so great it can't bear to think of anything harming or destroying that which you love. Same thing with God's wrath. But we also have to remember about God's wrath because, because of the nature of His love for us, He's also provided a solution. There's a remedy to His wrath, and He's provided it Himself. He took human form and took our punishment, our place on the cross, died and then rose again so that we would not have to know that judgment or punishment, that we could be free from God's wrath. So God's love includes both wrath against them and the remedy for it in the cross. He's made possible that reconciliation that we need with Him. But unfortunately, in Jesus' parable, the sin of the rich man was never repented of. And therefore it went unreconciled. And so his separation from God was eternal. There will come a day when there are no more second chances. And his sin was accepting poor Lazarus as just part of his landscape. Oh, there's Lazarus. Another day. He accepted the fact that he should be allowed to live in luxury and plenty while this man went wanting and he never made the connection that he had resources that might alleviate 
the suffering of this man who may have been just considered a smelling inconvenience. It was not what the rich man did that ended him up in hell. It's what he failed to do. He saw need and suffering and he did nothing. He did not make wise use of the wealth that God had entrusted to his care. The world might say, I, own, I earned it, I get to enjoy it. But God would say, yes, you earned it, you should enjoy it, and then with that which you have extra, you should use it to help others. Now that's also the lesson we hear in 1 Timothy today, in our New Testament lesson. Paul told Timothy to command the wealthy to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they might take hold of the life that is truly life. It's not a sin to be wealthy, but it is a great responsibility. The biblical principle is that the wealthy are told to do good with the surplus that they have. And the greater their means for doing good, the greater the responsibility for doing it. Winston Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. The rich man in the parable had both the means and the opportunity to make a difference. And he failed to do so. And the result was judgment and punishment. Now wait a minute. Is Jesus saying that what we do determines our eternal faith? Isn't our salvation determined solely on faith in Jesus and not by our works? Absolutely. That is true. Absolutely. But to receive Christ into your life means to receive His very Spirit within you, the Holy Spirit. To serve, to follow Him as Lord and Savior means to put your will in subjection to His will. And the will of Jesus is that we are to love others as we ourselves have been loved. And the love of Jesus did not pass us by in our sick and sinful state. The life of Jesus was spent sacrificially serving others with all that was available to him. A person who has truly given their heart and their will to Jesus as Lord of their life would be unable to ignore the needs of others when it was within their ability to do something about it. Our actions are a reflection of our beliefs. As Christians, we're called to a lifestyle of generosity. We're managers of God's resources, and when we are generous, as we talked about last week, we are sharing His very nature. God is the ultimate example of generosity. We're to use the personal wealth that He's entrusted to our care and as a responsibility to do good to others. The logic of heaven is the more we give, the richer we become. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to always remember that all we have is Yours. And you've given us more than we need, Lord. So what we can share, we want to do with your help. Give us generous hearts, Lord. Soften our hearts towards the needs of those who are less fortunate than us. Help us to have eyes to see the opportunities that you provide for us to do good with what we have. Forgive us for the times we've stepped past the Lazaruses that you have laid at our door. And help us to serve you by serving others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.